Welcome everyone to the Anderson Business Advisors podcast. It's Clint Coons here from Anderson Business Advisors. And today we have Gene Gerino of Residential Assisted Living Academy. Gene is a good friend of mine. We've spoken together on multiple stages and a lot of our students have found success with him. And I thought, you know what? I want to get this information out to people because so many people, when I run into them at an event, we're talking about asset protection and real estate investing and I'll throw out the word RAL. I get so many puzzled looks on people's faces. I mean, they've kind of heard of it. They don't know what those initials stand for. So I figured, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring out the nation's premier expert in residential assisted living. So everyone listening on this podcast can hear from the expert about what this means to them and what they can do with it. So Gene, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Glenn. Great to be here. Excellent. So, um, you know, you just got back from a cruise. Where did you just go? Uh, we're in the Southern Caribbean, cruising for uh, about nine nights, and uh, Robert Kiyosaki, G. Edward Griffin, Tommy Hopkins, and uh, 200 other people. We had a great time for a week floating around in the ocean. It was great. Wow, you're rolling with some power players in the industry, some real makers there. Uh, how did you get involved in that? You know, it's interesting. I had uh, Russ Gray, who's uh, one of the real estate guys, Russ and Robert. Russ came out and saw me speak in Dallas, and he, we sat down, and he said, you know what? I want to start working with you. And he had me out to one of his events, and next thing you know, I'm on the cruise, and next thing you know, it's five years later. I've done it five years in a row. It's a fantastic event. You don't get bored going to the same islands all the time? Well, you know, this one was a little bit different. We did Curacao, we did Bonaire, and we did some other places I hadn't done before, but it's the people, and that's what's great. It's just like hanging out with you. The few times I get to see it in <laughs> different locations, we get a chance to catch up, and it's great hanging out with real people. Well, that's awesome. Now, let's just talk about your business. So, how did you get started? You know, I started in real estate when I was 18 years old, which is a lot younger than a lot of people. And it was because I was in business already. I was a teenager, a professional musician, small record label, recording studio, music school. And we were renting a building for two years. The lease was coming up. The house was bad and the landlord was worse. And we said, that's it. We're either shutting this thing down or we got to go buy a house. And we did. So we bought the first house, no money down, no credit, no clue, bought it. And I haven't stopped since. But it was about 20 years ago so that I first heard about what we do now, which is residential assisted living. And I heard about it from the business perspective, but it didn't become real to me until my mom needed help. And that's when I got into this business in earnest. And I've been teaching others how to do the same for the past six years. Wow. It sounds a lot like my life story, uh, getting started in real estate. So you start on your own. You didn't have a father that made you go out there and work every Saturday and Sunday or where you weren't in sports or something. Well, you know, I was uh, being, I had a choice, you know, you want yeah. the girls either way. It's either music or sports and music was a lot more fun. So I uh, did some sports, but I knew I wasn't going to be a pro. So forget that. Dad was a college professor. So it wasn't a lot of going oh, wow. on the weekends. Uh, I was off playing at the clubs by the time I was a teenager. Nice. Great place to get chicks, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, the, so, so RAL, so it's residential assisted living. So can you maybe explain that to people, what that actually means? Um, and how that can benefit them. You know, whenever somebody hears assisted living, they think old folks and they think of a big institutional building. So when I say residential assisted living, very specifically, it's a single family home that's been converted and we can talk about that. And it's being used specifically for housing seniors where their care is taken care of 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there might be eight, 10, 12 seniors in that home, 24 hour care. It's not independent living. They're not out playing golf and tennis and pickleball, but it's not a hospital. It's not, it's not a skilled nursing facility. It's not a nursing home. They don't need that medical care, but they can't stay at home alone. It's right in between. And that's what we do is we provide the housing, the care, and the ability to help these people is tremendous. And the money that you can make is great as well. All right. So, if I'm in real estate and I have, you know, single family rentals, it sounds like then do I have to go out and maybe buy a, an apartment building or a hotel to set something like this up? So the answer is you can, but that's not the model. We take a single family home and the conversion that we talk about might be grab bars in the bathrooms, maybe smoke detectors, fire suppression, maybe wider doors, take out carpets, so a little bit of conversion. And if you just want to be the real estate investor and lease it to an operator, that's one play. It's a great play because if you do that, you can charge higher rent because the business, the assisted living business itself is going to be making significant money. They can pay a higher rent and they're going to want a longer lease. So a long-term low impact tenant in that home, maybe a five-year lease with somebody paying twice the market rent. 
So a real estate investor can really use this for that exact purpose. Your question probably is, well, you said apartment building. Could it be that? It could be. But think of a home where there's one kitchen, one family room, individual bedrooms or shared bedrooms, but it's a home, not a hotel. Everybody mm -hmm. doesn't have their own kitchen or maybe even own bathroom, but they're living together kind of like a family in this shared housing setting and the caregivers are taking care of their needs on a daily basis. All right. So then really I wouldn't have to buy, if I already own real estate, I wouldn't have to go out and buy a new type of property. I could take what it sounds like as my existing property and just repurpose it to, to, uh, to an RAL. Is that correct? what I'm hearing? Yeah. The answer is yes, but let me expound on that a little bit. The okay. location is critically important. It's not the house. A lot of times, Clint, people will come up to me and say, I've got the perfect house. And I look at the house and I'm like, you're right. The house is perfect. It's just in the wrong location. So when I say location is important, what I mean is you want it to be near people that have parents who are 80, 90 years old. They have upper income, not lower income. So they have the ability to pay for the care for mom and dad. So the best place to have these homes would be where people like me live, 50, yeah. 60 years old, parents are 80, 90, not low end, not the top of the top cream of the crop of that upper middle income, because that individual might be paying 4,000 or 6,000 or 8,000 per month to take care of mom and dad. So we don't do Medicare and Medicaid. If somebody has long-term care insurance, that's terrific, but very few people have that. We do private pay. So the homes are typically gonna be larger, the average rental property that somebody listening, watching right now is probably three bedroom, two bath home. It's probably 2000 square feet or less. We do bigger homes with more bedrooms, more bathrooms. So my homes are four or five, 6,000 square feet. They may have started with four bedrooms, but now we've converted space and there might be eight or 10 bedrooms in that home. Maybe it started with three or four bathrooms, but now it may have six, eight or 10 bathrooms. So we do some conversions to make it nicer in a nicer area. Because the nicer the home, the nicer the area, and we're going to be in the right demographic area, the more they pay on a monthly basis. Yeah, so this isn't about, you know, warehousing people and putting bunk beds or something in a room. Uh, it's about providing a nice facility for individuals because, I mean, you wouldn't want to take your parents to a home and think, all right, they're just going to be thrown into this place and, and treated like orphans. We want to actually give them a, a home where they, you know, I would want to live, it sounds like. Yeah, you know, that's actually how I got started. When I said that my mom needed help, we then went out to look to see what are the solutions, the options for us. And they were pretty bad. They were pretty depressing. Mm -hmm. The good homes were very few and far between. They were full with a waiting list. And even the bad homes had waiting lists. So there was a, a real need for the beds, but also the caregivers. It's not just the real estate, the bricks and sticks. It's the, the people that are there taking care of mom and dad. That's where you really can provide a tremendous service and we can make some great money. Uh, and I, I keep going to that because I know that there's a lot of people listening that are about protecting assets, but generating income. But we have a motto. It's called do good and do well. So we want to help people do good, do well financially. And we do it with a real estate play, right home, right location, right size, right whatever it is. And then on the business side, this operation of that residential assisted living, that's where we can charge that four, six, eight thousand dollars per month per person to live there. So, so it could be for real estate investors who already have properties or looking to buy. But you come keep coming back to this that if I don't have a house, it sounds like I could still get into this business and start making a play here if I find property. I guess you would just lease it. Is that what you, how yeah. it would work? If you want to be the real estate investor in that side of things, mm -hmm. this is a key point. I'm glad you asked. I want you to find the tenant first, the person you're going to lease it to first. The house is easy. What you really need is that operator. Now, I've used the word a couple of times here, business. It's actually a residential home in a residential setting. We're not operating a business. It's a group home for the elderly. We're protected by the Federal Fair Housing Act. We can do it even with HOAs and so on. We can have that conversation. But that, that house itself that we were going to buy to rent out, most people just buy a house, then they look for a tenant. I want you to do a completely opposite. Find that tenant. Well, Gene, where do I find that tenant? You come to my training and they're sitting right in that room or find an existing one, one that is operating in your area now. Ask them, do you want another home? Would you like to expand? A lot of them would. And then you can say, if I buy the house, would you be interested in leasing it from me or maybe partnering with me? 
So that's the way to take that angle, that play, find that operator, then let them tell you where the house should be, how big it should be, what it should look like and feel like, then go buy it and lease it to them for that five years with five year renewals at twice the market rent. Yeah, because it sounds like, you know, now you're, you're putting it into a niche and you have something that people need in that area because they don't want to spend the money to buy their own homes. You know, I want to, you know, the money you keep talking about uh, sounds really attractive to, to many individuals. And, and that's why they have seen so many people at your trainings. Mm-hmm. So I'll tell you what, we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, let's talk about the money. Hey, if you like what you're seeing here on my YouTube channel and you want to go deeper and you want to learn more, just let you know, we teach three-day asset protection workshops all over the country. In these workshops, we go really deep into all these topics and show you how to set this up. And more importantly, we meet with everyone one-on-one to help them design a plan. This is your opportunity. If you're interested in attending one of our workshops, go right into the show notes now and you can see a link there where you can register for one of my upcoming three-day tax and asset protection workshops for real estate investors. Hey, it's Clint Coons here with the Anderson Business Advisors podcast and we're back with Gene Gerino from Residential Assisted Living Academy. And you know, right before the break, we started talking about how much money you can make with an RAL. And Gene, I mean, the numbers are there. I, I've worked with your clients on the asset protection side, and I know that they're making really good money at this, but how about the listeners? Why don't you tell them what they can actually expect to earn by putting together one of these deals? All right. I'm going to give it to you a fire hose. So here okay. we go. The average person in the U.S. today is spending $4,000 per month per person to live in an assisted living home. Now, if you take out Medicare and Medicaid and even the uh, long-term care insurance, what we focus on is a level three or level four. We break it down into five levels. So not the bottom, which is level one, not the top, which is level five, but level three, four. So four to $8,000 per month is really what we're focused on. But I'm gonna use the 4,000 since that's the average. Take an average home in the US today. Some of those homes have six or eight people. Some have 10 or 12 people. Some have 16 or 20 people in them. You're not warehousing grandma. These are big homes that are well-appointed. But let's use 10 as the average. So 4,000 per month per person times 10 residents. That's potential gross income of 40,000 per month. Now you're not gonna be full all the time. So you need to factor in vacancy and so on. But your expenses to pay for the caregivers, the food, the insurance, the real estate and everything is gonna be around $25,000. So that leaves you 40,000 minus 25,000 brings us down to 15,000, 10,000. So that 10 to 15,000 net per month is a real number. That's what we look at. Now I'm gonna give it to you in a different form. If you're grossing 40,000, you can expect 20 to 30% netting out of that gross income of 40,000 on a monthly basis. Yeah, so when I was doing the numbers when you're talking about it, it sounds like you get about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per person net that you put yeah. into your home. All right, so then the flip side, you were talking about if I had a property and I don't want to run this, mm-hmm. but I want to bring someone else in that's already running these homes and let and lease my house to them. So if I have a house that I'm currently say renting out at eighteen hundred dollars a month, it's a four bedroom home a three to four bedroom home, I can turn around and then lease that to someone else. And what do you think I could get off of something like that? 2,500, three grand? I'm going to, it, it all depends, right? You you get, if you ask, and it's so interesting to me, Clint, because you and I speak at a lot of events and I'm in front of people and every once in a while, somebody just raises their hand and they're like, I've been leasing a home to people that have been operating that business for years. And I didn't know I could charge them twice the market rent. And the answer is you can charge them anything you want. If you didn't ask, you're never going to get. Exactly. For 18, I would start at 3,600, twice the market rent. But that four bedroom home, two bath home, the key is the location. If it's in the right location, it's worth paying twice the market rent. So again, want to go back. You own a home. That was the scenario. Find an operator. Then say, hey, I have a home here. Is this a good area for you? What would you need me or want me to do to this house? for you to lease it for five years with that twice the market rent. And they may say something like, well, I need you to put in smoke detectors or fire suppression or grab bars. Well, Gene, am I going to do all that work? It's all negotiable, right? If I'm the tenant, I'm going to negotiate to have the landlord do it. If I'm the landlord, I'm going to negotiate to have the tenant to do it. But pause. How many of you listening would be willing to invest $20,000 into your own property to get twice the market rent with a five-year lease? No vacancies, no hassles. I'm guessing everybody's raising their hand in front of their computer right now or listening on this podcast. So 
don't be pinching pennies. If the home is in the right area, if it's an appropriate home, you can certainly lease it for more. The key is finding the right tenant first. Well, I mean, you brought up two things there, not only finding the right tenant, but also finding the operator. And, you know, in the show notes, we have a link where they, where they, anybody's going to be able to go to and they're going to be able to get a book that you've written that probably explains that I would imagine on how to go out there and find these people because I wouldn't know where to begin to find an operator that I could lease my home to and especially how do you find, how do you know if your home's in the right area as well and I, I mean we don't have time to go into that on this podcast since I know you teach a great class on that but that's all important right I mean you've got links you, you know how to find those people and you educate people on that. Absolutely. And, and just to clarify, when I say uh, tenant and you said operator, they're kind of one and the same. So mm-hmm. the operator is going to be the one that's renting that property from you. You're not renting it out to grandma or that individual mm-hmm. underneath. That's their job. They're the ones who are going to find those people living in the home and so on. You're just going to find the operator of the RAL who's going to lease it for that five years so they can operate this business in that location. And it's a great real estate play. We also have a lot of people, Clint, that are building brand new. And you know that because they're a client of yours as well. They're like, we've got the right location and we want to have the perfect home. So they're building it from scratch. And that's a great investment as well. Uh, When I gave you those rates of 20, 30% of the gross income, that converts to a 20% cap rate, a 30% cap rate. Those are huge, enormous numbers because this is not just an apartment building. If you're operating that business, making that 20, 30%, that's because of all the moving parts that you're involved in of owning and operating that business. Just want to do the real estate, twice the market rent, long-term tenant. You want to be involved in the business, 20, 30% cap rates are certainly possible. Wow. All right. So when you think working with elderly people, because I'm the attorney, the first thing that comes to mind is liability, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not if I'm going to get sued, it's when I'm going to get sued. So what are some of the, you know, make me three things that if I'm listening in on this, what do I need to be aware of from a liability standpoint, would you say? Yeah. And I love talking about this with somebody who's so knowledgeable like yourself, because you understand that a lot of people have no idea what the risks are, what their potential liabilities are. We do. We know when somebody moves in, it's not if, it's when. And we know that they're going to pass away in that house. 98% of the time, they're moving in and it's the last place they'll ever live. So think that through. If you have a rental property, two kids, a mom and dad, two dogs, the five-year-old jumps the fence, two doors away, drowns in a pool. Tragic. They're ticked off. They're upset that your fence wasn't big enough and strong enough and so on. If they don't have the right insurance and if they're not ready for it, that could be a big problem. With us, we're in a house, could be the same house. Grandma's not scaling the fence, right? But at some point she is gonna pass away inside that home. But the family isn't expecting mom to live forever. As a matter of fact, they may, and don't take this wrong, get to the point where they thought mom was gonna be there for a year or two and she's been there for five or six and they're like, well, that is tragic, but glad she's gone. They never say it out loud, but I can see by the smile on their face that. Now, they are going to be concerned. Was there any problem issues? Was there any? And you need to be a good actor. Nobody getting into this business should be somebody who's looking to take advantage of people or just gouge people financially. I want you to have the right heart as well as the financial incentive. But if you're doing a good job, if you do it right, the bottom line is you really should not be getting sued because people know that when they move in, grandma is going to pass away. The question is, do you operate properly or are you doing it the right way? The insurance policy, it's a professional liability insurance policy specifically for this industry. The cost is less than a dollar a day per resident per month. Wow. So 10 people, 30 days, that's $300 a month. It's a line item. It's not that expensive. It's not medical malpractice. We're not a medical institution, but it protects you $1 million per occurrence, $3 million for the policy. I've been in business for six years. We've never had a lawsuit Uh, in a home because of these issues. It's a question that people have all the time, but it's not really something that comes up very often if you're a good actor and do your job right. Yeah, because I think, you know, some people may be discouraged from looking at RALs as an opportunity as investing because there's been, I mean, you just go on the news and you'll see it. There's a lot of bad actors, uh, unfortunately, out there that I think give the industry a bit of a taint and and people then shy away from it. And so you really have to fight through that. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about that, those stories that we hear are usually what I call a big box facility, 200 beds, where there's 200 residents and there's 10 caregivers there during the day and two caregivers at night. Very little oversight, very little care, very little uh, 
interpersonal relationship. Now switch it to a home. It's a house. There's 10 seniors in there. There's two caregivers during the day and one at night. The caregivers know those residents by name. The residents and their families have eaten at the table together. They know each other. They love each other. Those caregivers are just as upset as the family members when they pass away because there's a bond. There's a love. And that's one of the reasons why I got into this, not just the money or the lawsuits and this and that. It's, you know, if you have a mom or dad, you understand somebody's going to need to take care of them. And it's either me or somebody else. And I want to bring them to a home where they're going to love them and take care of them. You're providing a tremendous service and a peace of mind for those people, those families, those residents. And it's something you can be very proud of. When I started mine, my, my whole goal was to have it be a home that I'd be proud to have my own mother, my own father move into. So that was the benchmark, and that's where we started. Wow. All right, we got to take another quick break here, and we'll come back. And I got a question for you about the myths surrounding RAL that are out there. Hey guys, I get a lot of great questions in my YouTube comments, and some of them oftentimes get a little, a little deep or a little heavy. Let me tell you this, if you want a strategy session, go right into the notes below the video here, and there's a link where you can click on that link and you can get a strategy session with one of the advisors at Anderson. Right now, we can set it up, we have you talking with somebody within a day about your individual situation to get all of your questions answered. It's the best way to know what you should be doing going forwards with your structures. It's free. Take advantage of it right now. Hey, it's Clint Coons here with Anderson Business Advisors Podcast, and I'm speaking with Gene Gerino of Residential Assisted Living Academy. And right before break, we were talking about lawsuits. I mean, here I am, an attorney, and of course, I'm going to ask him some questions about that. But there's also some things that we, we just, I asked him right before the break about the myths that surround residential assisted living. Because I know people have preconceived notions about this, about what they can do. I mean, I've listened to people before that throw out these crazy numbers of what you can make uh, in this in this space. And so, you know, what are some of the, t you know, maybe two myths or three myths, would you say, Gene, that um, are out there that we, you'd like to dispel? You know, there's uh, so many. Let me hit you with a whole bunch. It doesn't need to be in a commercial setting. You don't need to do multifamily. It's a single family home. You can do residential financing. You can do commercial financing, SBA, USDA, and so on. Uh, how do I find caregivers and, and uh, managers and so on? You know, there's people that are attracted to this industry where they don't want to be a barista or a waitress or something else. They want to take care of the elderly. Uh, well, Gene, everybody's going to move in and sue me. No, we just went through that. Listen to the last section. So you've got it there. But I think one of the biggest myths is that uh, there's – maybe I'm too late to the game or I didn't know that I could do this or I'm competing with these big box facilities. How many of you listening have seen a big box facility open up Brookdale, Sunrise, Altria? They didn't open it up there by accident. They did the market research for you. They know that there's hundreds and hundreds of seniors that need the help, can afford it, and they're going to be there for decades. Your location is simple. Do it at the end of their driveway. And if you're wondering, well, how am I going to fill the house, marketing the, the house and filling the house itself, that's a big part of what we teach you how to do and what to do and what not to do. But referral-based marketing is your absolute best way. So you need to prime the pump, get that first resident. That's the hardest one. Then the second, third, fourth. By the time you're half full, it's like it goes like a hockey stick because people don't want to be locked out. The home is full. I can't even get in. Uh, so there's so many that I could do, but there's a half dozen for you right there. Perfect. All right. So if we're listening to this and, and no one's ever been exposed to it before, now they've got this uh, understanding of what RAL is. I mean, they've got to be thinking, you know, how easy is it to get started in the RAL? You know, I always love to answer that by saying it's simple, but not easy, right? And if everybody could do it, it was just simple, then I'd have too much competition. So I'm good with having some hoops to jump through and some, some barriers to entry. So here's the deal. In order for you to do this, you need three things. You need a house that is senior safe. We need to have policies and procedures or standard operating procedures. The state's going to want to see that you know what you're doing. And the third is you need a qualified manager. Every state's a little different in what that qualification is. But those three things, you fill in an application. The application could be one page or in Texas, it is 17 pages long. Don't let it bother you. Six of those are just redundant in case you have 48 partners. It's simpler than people may think. But if you know what you're doing and learn it from somebody who's done it before, it can walk you through. My goodness, things get a whole lot easier. Uh, but do it with the right attitude. It's a three-legged stool. We've got residents. You've got 
you've got the caregivers, the staff, and it's a business. So if you do this right, three-legged stool in the right location, you absolutely can do this simple, but not easy, but we'll make it as easy for you as possible. You know, just one other point on that. So if I lived in, say, New York, and I'm listening to this podcast right now, and you said you're from Arizona, it yeah. sounds like, you know, you, you've got this dialed in. So it doesn't matter where I live, I can do this if I have the right training to find out, you know, what New York is going to require versus Arizona, because you just brought up Texas and you said there's a different form that you fill out. Is that, is that something that people would need that type of training, I imagine? Absolutely. And every state calls it something different. So I say residential assisted living, but 20 states call it an assisted living facility. You know, other states call it a personal care home or assisted living residence. There's different names in different states. There's different paperwork qualifications. Short answer, it definitely can be done in any state. Certain states are better or easier, if you will, to do it in. But backing up for a minute, live where you want to live, but invest where the numbers make sense. There's some areas where I'm going to say, yeah, you can do it there, but I wouldn't suggest it or recommend it. Some areas are easier to do business in than others. And you know that so well, Clint. The, uh, it's one thing I love about you know, Anderson Advisors is you guys not only know the legal and the tax, but your business guys and you understand business and how it works together. I really like working with you guys and I appreciate you very much. Yeah, I mean, that's just what we teach. I mean, you don't know what you don't know and you don't want to make that mistake. We well, talked about just the terminology because if you start using the wrong terminology, you're going to hit roadblocks right away. And so it's, I mean, education in this space, especially, I think it's so much more important because there are very few people that offer it. And it's not like buying a single family home and just putting it up for rent. You have to know what the rules are and regulations in your location. So once you found that location, like you talked about, then it's going to le another level deeper, which we don't have time to go into on this podcast. But maybe we'll get you back and we'll do another one uh, to go deeper on it. But you've written a book and it's called Insider's Guide to Investing in Senior Housing. Uh, the link is in the show notes, but if people want to learn more, as we talked about, uh, they can go to andersonadvisors.com forward slash R-A-L. Okay, so andersonadvisors.com forward slash R-A-L. And you've given us a copy of your book that they can download. And there's a video as well that they're going to get. Is, is that my understanding? Yeah, there's a webinar there and they can uh, download a copy of the book, which is uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Happy to sell it to you there, but get it free right here. It's just for you. And if you just want to call and have a conversation, what we call a discovery session, feel free to do that as well. Perfect. So everyone, make sure you take advantage of that. If you're looking at uh, getting into residential assisted living, or even if you're not, I would still go download the information because you don't know what you don't know. And there are opportunities out there. And, you know, being an avid real estate investor myself, I'm always looking for ways to get a higher return on my investment properties. And what we just presented today through what Gene teaches people is how to do that. Anything else you want to say in passing, Gene, before we yeah. sign off? Yeah, just one last thought is you're all going to get involved in assisted living one way or the other. You're either <laughs> going to own the real estate, the business, or you or a loved one is going to be living in a home, writing a check to somebody who does. Right now, you've got a choice. And leave a blessing to your kids, not a burden. Imagine moving into the master bedroom living for free with nine or ten other people writing you a check for five, six thousand instead of leaving your kids the burden of deciding what do we do to take care of dad or mom. You're going to get involved one way or the other. Make a good choice. That's great. All right, Gene, thanks for coming on. Thank Talk you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.